I write books for young kids and middle school kids and high school kids. I mostly write nonfiction, but I also write some fiction. And these are some of my newest books. So as you can tell, I like to write about people. They interest me. I like to sort of figure out what makes them tick and why they do what they do. And I generally pick my topics based on something that excites me and something that I start to learn more about and I want to really learn everything I can about it and then tell a story and share it with you guys. So I've covered some people this year like Alexander Calder in Sandy Circus, which is about an American artist who invented the mobile. That is amazing. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton. You all know who Elizabeth Cady Stanton was, right? She started the women's suffrage movement. She was the first woman to stand up and say, hey, um, women don't have the right to vote, and we need to talk about that. So the very first time that there was a meeting to talk about that was because of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Ella Fitzgerald, who was one of our greatest jazz singers. And then I came across a mention of these 13 women that the press has called the Mercury 13 women. And we'll talk a little bit about why they have been called that later. But I came across um, a little sentence about them when I was researching a book about Alain Ramon, who's Israel's first astronaut, who was Israel's first astronaut. And I thought, wow, that's so interesting. I've never heard of them. And I, I kind of know a lot about the space program because it really interested me. So I kind of tucked it away. And when I had time to go back to it, I started reading about it. And the more I learned, the more passionate I became about figuring out what really happened to these women and who they were and how they felt about this and what happened. So anytime I work on a nonfiction story, my job is to research sort of to the point of exhaustion. I read every single thing I can get my hands on. I read books and I also try to do a lot of primary source research. Do you know what primary source research is? Primary meaning first, right? A primary source is something like a journal entry or a letter, diaries, um, even photographs can be primary sources because that's right in the voice of the person that something happened to. Does that make sense? So I use as much primary source information as I can because if you can imagine, if you're telling somebody the story about something that happened to you, it's different than if your friend is telling something about what happened to you, right? And anytime you read a book or a newspaper article or really anything that's in print or on video, it's always told from the author's point of view because we're human beings. And anytime I'm telling a story, I can't help but tell it through my eyes, through the way I look at the world. So remember that when you read things because every single thing that's written is written through the eyes of the person telling the story. So with that in mind, I want to also share with you that I take my job so seriously because I'm sharing true information, as true as I can humanly possibly make it, with you guys. And I don't want you guys to get incorrect information stuck in your head, right? Everybody knows the story about George Washington and the cherry tree, right? George Washington chopped down the cherry tree, right? Mm -hmm. Right? No. no, he didn't. But why do we know that story? We know that story because a few years after George Washington died, Somebody wrote a biography of him, and in the style of the writing of the day, as a way of making a point and saying what an honest guy George Washington was, the author wrote a story. And it was sort of like if George Washington had chopped down a cherry tree, he would have been the kind of guy to run home and tell his parents. And that was sort of the point of the story. Um, of course, it didn't happen, but it did get put in a book and repeated and repeated. So when I write nonfiction, I do the very best job that I can to make sure that I take all the pieces of the puzzle and put them together the best way I can to tell the most truthful and most accurate story I can. But of course, it's always through my eyes, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this new book, Almost Astronauts, the story of the Mercury 13. And I'm going to start by reading a short piece, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what happened to them. So first, I'm going to show you a picture. This picture is from the isolation water tank testing. And the reason I'm showing it to you before I read to you is because the words that I wrote make it a little bit more uncomfortable because it was pitch black. 
But in order to take a photograph like this, the camera needs to use flash, a flash bulb, right? So in order to actually take the picture, the flash makes this look brighter than it is. So I want you to see the tank, but I want you to also know that from Jerry Cobb's position, who's in the tank, this room is pitch black. It's not il illuminated like it is here in this photograph. Okay, so. This is from chapter three, The Tank. Picture this. You are surrounded by complete and utter darkness, pitch black. All you can hear is your heart beating, your breath as you inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. You are floating in a tank of water at the exact same temperature as your body. Where does your body end and the water begin? A full over the head mask with air hoses to breathe through is used with some subjects, but drips of water creeping in could be distracting and the airline sometimes leaks. You opt for foam pillows around your ne neck and waist to help keep you afloat. It is peaceful, quiet, dark. Your mind drifts. What did I have for dinner last night? What was that joke? Where should I go on vacation? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine hundred and ninety-nine, one thousand. My ten favorite movies are You Are Bored, It Is Too Quiet. You smack your hand on the surface of the water. You cannot feel the splash. It is too dark. So dark your eyes cannot adjust. But wait, is that a sliver of light coming from over there? You think you remember seeing the door there back before the lights went out? When was that exactly? An hour ago? Two hours? Six? Is there a light coming in under that door or not? It can't be. The room is light proof. Still, you are sure you see it. Light creeping in, flickering, teasing your brain. You smell hamburgers cooking on a grill. Impossible. The eight inch walls make the room smell proof too. Are you hallucinating? The thought makes your breath come faster. You speak simply to hear more sound. How long have I been in here? No reply. Don't panic, you remember now. They told you no one would answer you. Relax. You reassure yourself that nothing in this room can harm you. You are in no danger. You are here of your own free will. You inspected the tank yourself, saw that it was round and deep and contained nothing but water. Nothing. I need to get out. The lights flip on and a scientist comes into the room to help you out of the isolation tank. You ask how long you were in and they ask you to estimate. About eight hours? It has been only two. These were the feelings that many people who participated in Dr. J. Shirley's isolation, isolation tank experienced. At first, they found the floating sensation peaceful. They meditated, they enjoyed the silence, but more than half would then begin to have hallucinations, seeing, hearing, and smelling things that were not there. Voices talking to them, lights flashing, the smoky odor of burning toast. One man saw a giant frog, an ocean liner, and a larger-than-life man looking down on him. Some people would sing or be overwhelmed by childhood memories and start to cry. Others would talk incessantly about the people in their lives or moments that bothered them or surprised them or made them happy, sad, or angry. Some ticked off grocery lists, anything to pass the time, to mark the time in whatever way they could. Isolation testing was considered important from the beginning of the space program since being in space is probably the most challenging form of isolation a human being will ever encounter. Being sealed up in a space capsule thousands and thousands of miles from Earth could trigger a panic attack. And having a panic attack in space is not like having a panic attack at your desk. You could die and destroy millions of dollars of worth of equipment in the process. But none of the Mercury 7 men went through the water tank isolation testing, which was much more rigorous than the simpler test they took in an empty room. One reporter asked Dr. Shirley if he could give the tank a go in order to write a story about it. For 30 minutes, he was calm and quiet. But for the next four hours, he couldn't keep his mouth shut. He babbled, he sang, he heard a dog bark, he had a fit of hysterical laughter, he whistled to keep up his courage. He saw copper-colored coins that weren't there. He acted as though he were drunk, talking to a voice he believed he heard talking to him.